Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Well, Andrew, this is one of my very favorite episodes. Well, we do this every 10 times, so I have lots of favorites, but this is an Ask Andrew Anything And you don't even let me see the questions before. (laughs) That's the part that makes me a little nervous. (laughs) But you're always so good at these. Well, we also can edit things if they (laughs) turn out badly, so there is mercy. Tis true. Tis true. So I have seven questions to ask you today. So we'll see. If we get through all seven. (laughs) If we get through all seven. All right. Because these have to be short enough that I can listen to them on my morning walk. And I assume our listeners who are walking right now. Come on, girl. Keep it up. You can do it. You got another mile to go. Here is question number one. My son is not a fan of reading, but he's not a bad reader, just motivated. Can you give some tips to help? This is from Celine. Well, Celine, I've heard that one a lot of times. Uh, You have to look at it through a boy's eyes. One thing that struck me was one time my son said to me, when you're reading, you're not doing anything, right? Meaning you're kind of stuck in one spot and you you don't feel action. Now, of course, it should be imagination. There should be internal activity going on. But boys are very anchored to the real world. That's why they they like physical activity. They like real history. They like things that you can grab and hold and throw and punch. And sometimes... They go through a phase, I guess, where they don't necessarily get caught into the world of imagination in such a way that they would rather do that than be building a fort or wrestling or playing a sport or experiencing something more what they would perceive as as real. But you're a mom of boys. Yes. Would you agree with that observation? Yes, and I think definitely that, and I'm, I'm anxious to hear what your advice is to her. This would be my two cents before you give her the real answer. I had a son, one son in particular, who who struggled with finding the right position to read mm. because, you know, moms, we want them sitting in the chair or sitting at the table. He found his most comfortable position reading was laying on the couch with a book on the floor, and he would read for hours that way, but not in a chair. So maybe it's just a position thing. Hmm. Well, it could be it could be that. I know some men who read pretty much standing up or pacing. One time, <laughs> true confessions here, I was alone in the house and I was reading, but I had just actually read this article on how sitting down is like the new smoking and we're all going to die young because we sit all day. And so I was standing up, but the light wasn't as good as I wanted it to be because of age and eyes and glasses. So I was actually standing on the coffee table (laughs) in the living room in our home so I could get closer to the light. And my my teenage daughter walked in and beholds this sight of her father standing on the coffee table reading a book. What are you doing? And did she post that picture on Instagram? I hope not. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is that. So what I would say is there's a few factors. Position could be one. I think that allocating time is mm-hmm. important too. If if a boy feels like, okay, what, what I'm being asked to do is read here for a certain amount of time, I can do that, right? None of us like kind of an endless interminable feeling of how long is this going to last. I mean, it's very nice to know that Kristen is sitting here and is going to give us the fingers for number of minutes left. Because if I didn't know, I might say, how long will this be? (laughs) Of course, I enjoy doing this. So that might be one thing is just try to set a certain amount of time and then let him choose the times that he wants to do it. And so his responsibility, Mm -hmm. read half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever is decided. Another thought would be try to go more into what's interesting. You know, I think 
I'm at an age now where I really don't have to use my free time to read anything that I don't want to read. That's one of the great advantages of being grown up is you can read what you want to read and eat what you want to eat and kind of go to bed when you want to go to bed, <laughs> but then you have to get up and work. <laughs> it doesn't always work. But I think boys sometimes go into having to read something that they don't believe they're going to be interested in, mm -hmm. and they, they predetermine the fact that they're not going to be interested, and then it's just kind of a blah experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So getting the boy more choosing that, certainly there are some authors who understood boys a lot better than other authors. A lot of boys I've met, they're so into reality that they really don't like fiction as much as you would think they should. So historical fiction mm. is going to be very good. Or real history biographies, you know, are, are often interesting. So I guess looking at all those variables, position, the timing, and then the content, and don't worry about it. It's not a big deal if a 13-year-old boy doesn't want to read all day. In fact, you might worry if you had a 13-year-old boy <laughs> who just wanted to read all day. That may be our question on our next podcast. <laughs> Someone will in insert that in. Okay, great. So I have a question from Tamara or Tamara. Are online classes valuable? How does one make the most of them, especially when working with teens? Well, there's two types of online classes, essentially. There's the live classes, such as we offer here, with a live teacher and a limited number of students and a lot of interaction. And then there's, uh, I guess, what's called asynchronous classes, where you can log in, you can watch video, you can read texts, you can take quizzes, you can submit papers. Those are, are more canned, obviously. To make a, a categorical statement, are online classes valuable? I think the answer is in some circumstances, yes, and in others, probably not. I mean, you can't really answer that. I know our online classes are very valuable for a few reasons. One is I meet people all over the world that come up to me and say, I'm in your class with Mrs., you know, whoever the teacher is. They're obviously excited, and I'll say, well, you enjoying it? Are you learning? Oh, yes, yeah, she's such a great teacher. And so we're able to give very detailed feedback on writing assignments, which is really the bulk of the work. You know, the teacher can present information and interact with the students for an hour a week online, but the time they have to put into marking up those papers and giving the individualized feedback, that's really what you're you're paying for. Right. Because our online classes, I just want to mention this, the teacher's doing very little instruction, an hour a week of reinforcing what the students have already learned through your videos. So they're using the student writing intensive videos. And then, of course, they're grading. So so our students get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. they, they get the, the consistency of the video presentation and the organized content. And then they get the teacher who can give them the feedback and play some games and answer some, you know, ask some interesting questions. And yeah. So I also have friends, and, and I have a few teenage kids I know, that do online classes through, you know, a university or through an organization that offers that asynchronous style. Mm -hmm. Usually the purpose of that is for college credit. So they can take a class, pass the tests, and get transferable college credits for a fraction of the cost of sitting in a classroom attending later. So for a dual enrollment purpose, one of my little friends, she's uh, quite a whippersnapper of a kid. I think she's 15 right now. I introduced her to the idea, and she did U.S. history. Mm. She loved it. She said, I learned so much. And then she did U.S. government and said, it wasn't quite as interesting, but I sure learned a lot. You know, So she mm -hmm. could make the best of it. But mm -hmm. she's kind of a very self-directed determined type of kid, I would say not every student would necessarily have the same good experience she had with that canned content. So it depends on personality and circumstances and subject matter and purpose. Okay, this is another boy question, which kind of cracks me up because you only had one boy. Right. Yeah, I had six girls, one boy. You had three boys, no girl. But I don't have a talk called Teaching Boys... 
<laughs> so, I but guess you know my talk well enough. I mean, you could probably answer some of these questions <laughs> the way I would, but then we wouldn't be having a conversation. No, then it would be ask Julie anything, and that doesn't have that nice little A A A thing right. going. So, maybe we'll another time you can interview me. We'll we'll do it in July, and we'll call it Joke with Julie in July. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll get our alliteration. <laughs> then we will, except Julie doesn't tell jokes. So. Oh. <laughs> okay, so here is one from Rachel. She has an eight-year-old son who's normally congenial. He will consistently tear up and become physically anxious when asked to do something out of his comfort zone. After encouragement, he will finally attempt whatever was asked of him. I don't think he's purposely trying to delay. I believe he's actually anxious because he doesn't think he can do it perfectly the first time. He's very bright, but when it comes to writing, he struggles even with basic copy work. With that background, is there an age where this will be naturally overcome, or is this a matter of mommy needing to train or discipline better? And then she says, thank you for all you do. And, P.S., my children love your jokes on YouTube. <laughs> oh. Yes, it's causing a problem for me, all these jokes on YouTube, because I used to be able to go to classes and tell a joke or entertain some kids on the conference, you know, exhibit hall floor. Now all these kids, I mean, they know all my <laughs> jokes, so I'm desperately having to come up with new jokes. Well, I would point out to this mom that you know there's a few things to consider one is eight years old is very young and while we do have this context that all children should begin their academic life at five and a half years old and if you aren't doing grade three reading and writing and math by the time you're eight you're somehow behind Uh, this is a very pernicious and harmful Mm -hmm you know, almost universally held concept with parents. And it creates so many problems in schools. It creates so much anxiety for parents. There are countries in this world that are generally considered far above ours in terms of academic quality. Hmm. Scandinavian countries come to mind first. And they don't push academics that young at all. One of the seminal books that was, I think, very helpful in the beginning of the homeschool moment was Better Late Than Early. You can actually poison a child against wanting to learn to read or wanting to learn to write or wanting to learn math or anything if you try to force them to do it before they're neurologically ready for it. While this does vary greatly, it is true that at that age, girls tend to be a year or two ahead of boys neurologically at six, seven years old. So one thing that moms can kind of unintentionally do is remember what they were like at seven and say, well, you know, I was doing all this stuff at seven. My my son is like not even close. So even if they don't have a a girl daughter, you know, a, a daughter in the family to compare with, they can, they'll can compare with their own memory of themselves. So I think it's very important to realize that age is not a determining factor in when children should begin doing something or when it becomes easier. Mm-hmm. It will become easier at a different time in everybody's life, and it's as bad to force it prematurely as it is to try and force a child to walk before they're ready to walk. They'll walk when they're ready. Yes. And for you to try to push that could be neurologically and physiologically damaging to the child. So kind of relax. So that'd be the first thing I would say is just realize boys at eight years old are still young and you, you don't have to have a concrete expectation about academic stuff at that age. The second thing I would point out is that, yes, some people have a, a perfectionism that's kind of natural or instinctive, maybe genetic, who knows, mm. and other kids don't have that same kind of compelling need to do everything right the first time. So there's an aptitude on that, a scale. Wherever the child is on that scale of hyper or hypo-perfectionistic, 
that will be exacerbated, amplified by the environment, right? So if you have a naturally perfectionistic child who lives in an environment that reinforces, you really have to do your best. You really have to be perfect or somehow we're going to be dissatisfied. Then that can create a lot of anxiety or angst. So I think it is something for the mom to say, well, uh, I just need to constantly remind him it's okay not to get it perfect. It's okay to mess up your letters if you're copying. It's okay to get help, mm-hmm. right? You you know, as well as I do, that a lot of parents have a fear that if they help their children too much, they won't be learning. And so they withhold help, which mm-hmm. is one of the four deadly errors of teaching writing. And uh, it's, a, I think, a very important, helpful talk for mm-hmm. for all moms. But it, it goes beyond writing, too. If a child feels like they can't do something, they will refuse to do it because most children would prefer anything over failure. I mean, they'll prefer punishment over failure. Right. I remember one incident in particular having to do with cleaning a bathroom. And this was an attempt of me to force my son to clean a bathroom. Well, I went about it in a very realistic way logical way by making him a concrete checklist. This is what you do. Well, you know, half an hour later, he, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. And well, it's right here on the checklist. I don't know how to do it. Okay. So I sat there, I pulled up a chair and I sat there Mm -hmm. and I just coached him. This is what you do next. Mm -hmm. Not, not doing it for him, but breaking every little step into smaller little steps. And we finally got this bathroom clean. It was a horrific use of time because I had a whole lot of other things I would have preferred to have been doing. But the funny thing is that that night when we had our good things at the table, Mm. everybody says, oh, what was a good thing for you today? He said, cleaning the bathroom with dad. (laughs) Aww. Okay, well, all of those whining and tears and complaining and arguing dissolved once he got the help he needed to be successful. So I think sometimes we we are afraid of helping too much when in actuality, if we don't help enough, the child can't really do it and feel like he did it and was successful and learn the process. So those would be the few bits of advice, but... I don't think there's any magic wand to remove a perfectionistic tendency. You kind of just have to continuously say, hey, it's okay. You know, we all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. All I hope is that you'll do your best when you can and and just reinforce that kind of continuously. Good. Excellent. I hope that helps, Rachel. I now have a question from Sharon. She asks... In what order should I help my nine-year-old revise things? If I go over punctuation, spelling, and content, he may just crumble. How do I pick my battles on what to correct? I think Sharon should, as soon as possible, go listen to the first part of the Four Deadly Errors of Teaching Writing. And we'll include a link to that talk in our show notes, and we'll make that available to our listeners for free. Yeah, that would be great. Because what I hear her saying is that she's a term you often hear moms use, go over it, right? Mm -hmm. So she's going over it, which translated means student sits there, mom sits next to him or her and explains everything that student did wrong and what they should have done instead of what they did. And I'm pretty sure that most kids and and a huge supermajority of boys, they just tune it out very quickly and they're not really hearing what you're saying they're maybe hearing like on the old Snoopy cartoons, wah, 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 wah. Yep. or or they're super imposing over what you're saying, a little mental recording. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I never make her happy. I never do this right. I hate this. So in short, my advice is don't go over it. Take the paper you've got, edit it, put in a missing comma, put in a period in a capital, Cross out a lousy word, put a good one, fix a spelling, make a, make a fragment into a complete sentence, but, but make as few changes as possible. And don't try to make it good, just make it legal. 
hand it back to the child with no lecture attached. Don't try to explain why you made all the marks that you made. Just hand it back with no lecture attached and say, here, copy this over with these changes and you're finished. Or if it was typed, implement these changes, print out another copy, and you're finished. Now, you might be worried, oh no, aren't we teaching all these important things we need to teach? But in a way, you're teaching them more effectively than trying to explain it all. I call that explanation style kind of ex post facto, meaning it's too late. It's after the fact, right? There's, he's not going to really get what you're saying and then carry it into the future and apply that. But what's interesting is you can, you can bang your head against the wall all day and talk yourself blue trying to explain, you know, at the end of a sentence, which is a complete thought, you put a period, and then the next word after the period has to have a capital. You can say that a thousand times, kids still ignore you. But if you just put on this paper, period, capital, period, capital, period, capital, period, capital, hand it back to him and say, here, copy this over, right? And then he's going to, period, capital, period, capital. And at some point, you don't know how many times it'll take, but at some point he's going to say, oh, this is one of them spots where she's going to make me put a period and a capital. <laughs> and so he'll be learning by example rather than by explanation. And for a lot of kids, especially boys, that's going to be more powerful. So I would say try to make as few changes as you can, a f as few edits to make it legal, hand it back, no lecture, copy it over, and just do that time after time after time. You probably get a better result. So thinking of the four deadly errors, I think CM has a question related to that. Okay. She's trying to help her child. How do you know if your child genuinely needs to dictate or would benefit from having to practice getting it from their head to the paper? What skills might they be losing by skipping this? So I'm, I'm assuming that when she says dictate, she's saying that the child will say what he wants to write, and then she, as the mom, will write down what he is saying, which you know we, we might call scribing mm -hmm. for the student. And what skills would he be losing by not writing it down himself, I guess. So there are children who are just too young or they are too dyslexic or dysgraphic or have coordination issues that make it extremely difficult for them to write on paper. Mm -hmm. So you then look at, you know, how do you address that challenge and at the same time make progress in composition? So I would say using a Suzuki method approach, separate the complexity. If at all possible, I would encourage the mother to require this child to just do straight copy work for 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes a day, depending on the age and mm -hmm. attention span, where he doesn't have to think of anything, but he can build the stamina of just putting words on paper. It builds an attentiveness to detail in terms of spelling, capitals, punctuation. It's patterning good language because... You're reading something that's correct. Now you're writing something that's correct. So you're gaining a lot of benefits from copy work. And we've had past podcasts on mm -hmm. whole whole podcast on the subjects of copy work. Yep. Well, at the same time, you can do the writing assignments and let him dictate to mom. Now, I would ask, is this child able to make the keyword outline? Because that's where you read a sentence, choose the two or three keywords, copy those two or three key words, mm -hmm. right? Because that would be him making a choice. So rather than copying the whole sentence, he's got to think, copy those words. Then if you're working with a keyword outline, putting those words back into sentences isn't so hard, especially if you've got a decently short sentence and the three keywords you chose were the keywords, longest words, hardest words. You only have to add a few easy words and make it back into a sentence. So one possible step there would be if you've done it and you have a keyword outlined, however much mom helped in doing it, but you've got it. It's on the board or on a piece of paper. Now you could actually take turns. So the child can dictate the first sentence to the mom. She can write down exactly what he says. Then she can give the pen to the student. 
she can dictate the next sentence from the keyword outline, and he can try, try to write down what she said. Then he can give the pen back, and you can trade the pen back and forth. So the child is doing both things, the thinking of the sentence and also then the writing down the sentence that they hear. And that comes together at the point where the child thinks of the sentence, hears what he's thinking, remembers what he's thinking long enough to write down what he's thinking. So that, I think, those ideas to uh, just do the copy work to build stamina, be sure you're working with outlines and try to get independent there as quickly as possible, and then take turns writing the sentences. That gives them a chance to do all of those things that will then at some point come together. And, you know, I don't know if it'd be weeks, months, or years, but at some point I'll go, okay, mom, I can do this myself. Right. You know, leave me alone. I got it. <laughs> right. Good. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have today. Well, so it's always a pleasure, Andrew, to pick your brain. It's always fun to hear what questions people have. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it again soon. Okay. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really be grateful if you could just take some time today and rate us on iTunes. They are extremely helpful in letting other people know about the Arts of Language podcast. Again, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your educational journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.